but uh, just wanted to give you a quick rundown of uh, where I've come since the first article was published. Uh, quick background, about 15 years ago, I started uh, helping out a company in Oceanside, California, called MU Incorporated. Uh, it was uh, essentially a, 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 a one-person operation. And she was engaged in the business of manufacturing uh, replacement parts for uh, uh, high-voltage equipment, radar, x-ray, things like that, mostly used uh, as uh, uh, high-voltage clipper diodes, uh, modulators, and things of that nature. Uh, they uh, just recently closed, and I've been helping clean out the operation, and uh, it's actually parts of it are being picked up by another group who hopefully will uh, continue. Uh, but uh, they're still in the process of getting things going, and I'm expecting quite a bit of, uh, probably be helping them quite a bit in coming months. Anyways, as for small scale, which I've always been, been uh, considered myself uh, this, uh, doing this as a hobby, uh, if it ever became more than that, it would be work and therefore no longer any fun. Um, but just wanted to give you a quick run through. So, small-scale tube production. Who would ever do such a ridiculous thing? Uh, what's left? Well, <laughs> some people present excluded. Uh, there are still some applications that it's the only thing uh, that's really practical. In particular, uh, really high voltage, really high power. Uh, commercial applications such as, uh, you know, um, high, uh, high power UHF transmitters, microwave transmitters, uh, you know, still all of the all of the klystrons and all that that are still out there and used in, in uh, high-speed telecom. Uh, also, uh, x-ray. It's still the most practical way to generate x-rays. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the, uh, the uh, consumer applications, audio, this and that. I, I tend not to try to do anything with that because it's well serviced by foreign companies already. So typical things we start with, raw materials, which are all still commonly available, uh, come in a number of different forms. Here's the most common, sheet form, uh, roll or foil form, and wire form. Pretty much everything comes, excluding glass, of course, uh, will come in this form, and most tools for handling materials for production of tubes will conform to these three things. Stamping. Uh, probably the most critical part of, uh, of sourcing of parts. Uh, here's a few very simple, uh, very simple presses, uh, relatively light presses, where we'll make up our own tooling in a die shoe and stamp simple parts. Uh, compound parts, I'm sorry, very simple parts, we'll make with simple things like a block of rubber, a piece of metal, and a clipped piece of uh, nickel, where we will simply press them in an arbor press uh, make a form, weld them together, and just something for prototyping because tools to make stamp parts are very expensive. Many, many thousands of dollars a piece to have a professional tool maker make something good enough to make precision metal parts now. Uh, also, bending jigs, simple ones like this, which, uh, which you would take a pre-cut uh, pre piece, form it, weld it together, and arrive at something useful. Here's an array of various things, um, uh, some made uh, in-house, in garage in this case, and some by other manufacturers. Uh, complex shapes are made by the four-slide process. That, that's a whole talk unto itself. Look up the four-slide machine. Wonderful YouTube videos on how those machines work. Uh, wire die machines, it'll make things like that. Beautiful videos on that. Compound dies for pressing mica, which is actually one of the hardest materials to press. Uh, short of, I think there's some various versions of carbon and uh, carbon graphite that are a little more difficult, but by far mica is the most miserable thing you can work with. Uh, the next hardest thing to do, there, there was probably about 10 different things that got cut out in between that slide and this slide, but ask me later if you have more questions. Uh, the next most difficult thing to do on a hobbyist level is manufacturing of grids. Uh, they are very precision. Uh, that there is about a total of uh, a tenth of an inch across. And if you unwound that wire, uh, with the exception that you could maybe catch the, the, the fleck of gold off of it in the sun, you can't even see it. That's how small that wire is. It's less than a thousandth of an inch diameter. Uh, this larger one is made by a photolithography process. That's pretty simple. Photoresist, etch it fold it up and weld it. 
Uh, but the rest of these are all made on a uh, winding principle using a lathe. Various shapes are involved, and there's uh, tools that we use to get those shapes. This was actually a failure from a company that I was trying to help, but they were already so far in trouble that there was no amount of help that I could provide to save the company, and the owner actually ran and took the investor's money. Uh, but here, as you can see, there's a curvature which shouldn't be there. Uh, that is a failure of process and material science. Uh, in this particular instance, I determined their material was too hard. Uh, they could not relieve the stress from it, and they were not uh, stretching the material, which, of course, nickel being our primary material of use, is only work hardenable. Uh, and, uh, there is uh, no rolling process that can completely relieve stress and straighten properly with nickel. It must be stretched to straightness. These here are the grid winding machines that make those parts. A close up, in the traditional manner, you would have two side rods which are drawn through, a notcher and a peener. These are very similar to the uh, wheels used in pipe cutters, you know, uh, rotary pipe cutters, except they're very, very hardened, uh, ground, and then rehardened again. Uh, they notch the side rod on a subsequent revolution, a wire, not shown here, uh, but would normally be a wire, here is wrapped around, and on a subsequent revolution, peened by this lower roller, locking it into place. It's controlled by veneer, uh, uh, you know, uh, micrometers. After it's uh, wound, uh, typically uh, several grids per length, they're cut off on the machine, put in this contraption, which stretches it to length, therefore straightening them. And then uh, this is a foot-operated guillotine, which cuts them to final length. Next hardest thing to obtain is glass components. Now, uh, these here are commercially available. Uh, there are still companies that manufacture them. Uh, Osram Sylvania still sells product. There's a number of Chinese companies that still sell product. Uh, because glass blowing, I don't know if you've heard, is very difficult and an art. Uh, boy, are they right. I've, I've tried my hand at it for years, and it, it would take me decades more to get proficient at it. it that's, honestly the truth. Uh, so I prefer to simply buy ready-made parts. These components actually comprise the metal to glass seal to get your current in and out of the tube. Uh, generally speaking, they fall into two categories, uh, uh, wafer or flat press devices, uh, uh, flat press devices like this, uh, uh, which sometimes contain the exhaust tubulation and sometimes do not, just depending on the design of the, uh, of the part. Uh, generally, uh, what will happen is you'll build up the internal co tube components by spot welding on top of it, making what used to be referred to as a mount. Uh, that then, in turn, might look something like that. Uh, here's typical spot welders. Uh, this was our assembly room at the factory. It's now mostly cleaned out, unfortunately. But at this factory, they had up to 16 girls up here at any given time spot welding parts together. Oops. Then a bulb is placed over and uh, is sealed, typically in a rotary fashion. Uh, the remaining glass gets cut off and drops below. Uh, this is a single station machine for doing it. Uh, you must uh, preheat the material or else the water vapor trapped within the glass will just simply explode the glass. Uh, preheat, seal, and then anneal or else the stress will immediately fracture the part. Uh, automated machines like this, I was originally going to have one of these machines here actually making tubes just running in, out, out back all day long, but as soon as they heard about torches and flames and things like that, they got a little nervous, so I uh, can't, can't fault them for that. Uh, whereas this automatically will stay index station to station for a set amount of time and perform all those functions for you. 
I typically use a lathe because uh, these parts are expensive, and to set an automated machine up like that takes lots of parts that just simply get ruined. Uh, it consists of two uh, uh, synchronized heads, uh, which uh, run on a, uh, a spline shaft behind there. Uh, one head moves back and forward in a fire carriage. Uh, this combined with a hand torch will allow you to seal uh, blow, you can blow in an inert atmosphere to keep the components of your tube from oxidizing because, of course, uh, this here, uh, if you're using borosilicate glass to seal, is going to get well over 1,000 degrees, which will oxidize pretty much anything. Uh, so it's critical to do that and have the proper pressure that when you're trying to make this seal, it doesn't just simply try to blow apart from you, therefore wasting all of your hard work. If you get a leak in the tube, you can't, re you can't redo it. It's done. Uh, these materials are too sensitive. If you try to reheat them more than once, they'll fracture, and you'll never be able to anneal and remove the uh, strain in the glass. Uh, most of the operations on most of these machines are actually foot actuated, of course, to leave your hands free to manipulate whatever you're trying to do. Uh, when you sit at one machine for several hours, you get into the rhythm. If you're trying to make one at a time and you go from machine to machine, operation to operation, it's like you're trying to learn how to ride a bicycle all over again. These are typical exhaust stations that I use. Uh, they consist of a bake-out oven, uh, valving, and then switching. Typical system is a mechanical pump followed by a small diffusion pump. Uh, you can use turbo molecular pumps, but they're very slow. Uh, a tube res represents a very, very high gas load, and turbo molecular pumps are very slow at pumping high loads like that. Also, one of our primary uh, components of exhaust is hydrogen. Most parts in a tube are fired in a hydrogen reduction furnace to remove oxides and anything else that can be burned off. So it represents a very large load, and uh, turbo pumps, albeit will pump hydrogen, are very slow at it. Uh, typical valving. This is leak testing. So after you've put your tubes on the pump, uh, you run around with a handheld Tesla coil, and if you have a leak, and that there happens to be a leak, it will find it, and you'll be able to see the, uh, the ionization flare behind it telling you you've got a leak, and you've got to throw it away because it's useless now. Uh, after, oops. Yeah, why did you do that? Thank you. Uh, after pumping, uh, these ports go down into uh, O-ring compression ports in the bottom to make the seal. After pumping, you tip off with a handheld torch and you melt the exhaust tubulation, which would be in that area there, and then withdraw the tube from the pump. Uh, after it's cooled, you uh, process the tube by aging it. You Each design has a particular sequence of voltages and currents applied, which activate if it's an oxide-coated cathode, which would sublimate uh, the uh, oxide metal of your particular cathode to the surface, providing your emissive surface. And uh, they will uh, come up in emission as time goes on. And then dynamic testing for mutual transconductance, leakage, blah, blah, blah. And that was the 10-minute version of a 90-minute talk. If you have questions, please come answer, ask me uh, uh, because there's, there's I, you know. It, one time I actually was writing instructions for somebody, and I realized I was in two hours of just simply prepping and cleaning a material, and I realized it was still woefully inadequate to convey any information that they would really need to actually do it. <laughs> it's an it's a old technology, yes. It hasn't changed much since then. It remained largely the same from the 20s right on up till the 80s when they discontinued everything. There was a concerted effort in the mid-80s to uh, consolidate parts out to my friend's company. Uh, things that the government might need in the future. They were very uncertain about uh, rad-hardened parts in the 80s. And they came up with a short list of things that they needed into the future. They wanted somebody to be able to produce, particularly for things like radiation counters and things of that nature. So. Anyways, it's lunchtime. Go, go get lunch. If you have any questions, come ask me.